Well, good evening, everyone. We are back after a two week uh, hiatus, I guess you should say. Uh, I want to apologize to the audience for those missing two weeks. Thankfully, I had recorded two episodes in one day, and that was the Ayub and, and Ken Campbell episodes. And the very next day, I was out of action with COVID for several weeks. And so it, the physical symptoms never got really bad, such as congestion and the like. I had a really, really, really hard time with the uh, so-called COVID fog, and it completely wrecked my sleeping cycle, and I had nighttime insomnia, and it was a real struggle. So thankfully, those two episodes that we recovered got me through two weeks of that, and then just quite frankly, I couldn't get it together enough to uh, set up episodes for those next two weeks. So I apologize for that, but we are back. And you know, one of the great things that, about the show here has been the people who have helped set up episodes by making introductions and the like. And tonight we are joined by Mr. Andy Stanford. And this episode was actually set up by Ken Hackathorn. So that's a pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, intro yeah, there. Good. <laughs> yeah. So if somebody's going to be like, hey, you need to talk to this guy, having Hackathorn do that, that's a pretty good, pretty good card to, to throw on the table. So Andy Stanford, tell everybody who you are. Well, I... Uh... I guess I'll start at the beginning. I started quote unquote combat shooting, which is what we called it uh, uh, in 1977 with the Southwest Pistol League. And I was 15 years old. I had just turned 15. And fortunately my mentors, uh, in fact, it was funny as speaking of Hackathorn, there was a guns and ammo article that had this classic picture of Hackathorn, Michael Harris, Bruce Nelson and Ron Lurch with their their uh, arms around each other's shoulders and they were the winners of the shoot off. And uh, I had a Bianchi X-15 shoulder holster with a nine millimeter Colt combat commander that I'd gotten for Christmas. This is January. They, they brought Michael Harry's and said, Michael, make sure this kid doesn't shoot himself or anybody else. And I remembered him from the article. I was like, you're Michael Harry's. Oh my God. It was like meeting a movie star. And then, uh, uh, also, my mentors, Lyle Wyatt and uh, Michael Horn, uh, who, who uh, were Michael and, and Lyle, took over the Soldier Fortune match from Ken Hackathorn in the 80s and ran it for 20 years. But uh, anyway, what happened, and I'll probably get into this, is the, the gamesmen staged a coup in 1979 and uh, and booted Lyle and Michael out of the league and I followed my buddies. And as Lyle says, getting kicked out of the league was the best thing that could ever happen to us. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so through the eighties, I actually ran my own pistol club in Southern California and I shot the, the exercises that were put on by Michael Harry's. Uh, he put on a rifle exercise once a month and a pistol exercise once a month. And those were an experimental program where the, the purpose was to experiment, not to, not to compete. Um, and, uh, and I have to correct uh, Daryl Bolke. He said when, he said when Horn and Weidelich showed up, things got, got even worse, but it was actually Horn and Wyatt that put on these, these invitation only uh, often full surprise matches that were just devious. Then about, uh, oh, sometime in the early 90s, I was working at China Lake uh, Naval Weapons Center. And, and I just want to say up front, what I feel my party trick in this field is, is I was trained and worked as an analyst, so, which was to study things and write reports. So, so the way my mind works is to take the 10,000 foot view and try and figure out objectively what's going on. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I was at China Lake and uh, if you're married and your wife says, what do you think about moving to Florida? It means you're moving to Florida. Um, so I had to quit the China Lake job and I was like, well, what am I gonna do? And I decided I wanna be a firearms instructor. And so I worked towards that before I quit China Lake by going to gun site, trans Louis Arbuck, Clint Smith, Masada Yub, uh, maybe somebody else at that period. Uh, got going as a, a trainer 
but also uh, in 1994, I won the National Tactical Invitational at Gunsight, which, and I was also working for Surefire, and that let me get my foot in the door at American Handgunner and Gun. So I was actually a gun writer for better part of a decade and, uh, and a full-time trainer. I didn't, I didn't pay all the bills, but I paid the half that my, my now ex-wife didn't pay. Uh, so I worked, actually that was my job. And I, I taught in half the United States and Europe and Central America. One of the most fun things of that was for 11 years in a row, I went to Austria every summer and taught a couple of weeks of classes. I got a European vacation out of it. Um, and uh, I, I uh, been, I like what John Hearn said that he was nerded out about training. <laughs> I've been nerded out about training uh, since, since I got into this, I think, especially since I got into training. My first company, the first training I did was at the Soldier Fortune match in either 89 or 90 and the name of my company was the Marshall Marksmanship Institute. And then I figured out there was more to it than shooting to self-defense, hand-to-hand and the like. And so changed the name of my company to Options for Personal Security or Ops. And, uh, and I guess I kind of slowed down on the training around 2005, which is probably good because that's when YouTube came around and it would have been a whole different world. Uh, you are, as I said before you hit record, you are the best kept secret on the internet. And uh, the, the people you have on, uh, uh, not speaking for myself, but for everybody else you had on, <laughs> it really fascinating. You know, anything from Jay Hohenhaus to John Hearn, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, there's probably, I'm thinking the good information to bullshit ratios a lot better on this podcast than pretty much anything else on YouTube. Uh, well, well, thank you for that. I think definitely that owes to the to the guests that have, that have come on and the audience. You know, we have the running joke that you're not allowed to share the links with your dumb friends. You can only share it with the smart ones. Um, <laughs> I'm really cognizant of trying to avoid the mouth breathing part of the internet. And while I know that in, that would bring more clicks, so to speak, it might with somewhere down the road result in some financial gain that I'm not going to see. Otherwise I'm more interested in the information. Well, the, and, docu- you and documenting the people this. And like you said, there's some of them dying off uh, and you got to make sure to capture that information where you can. Uh, we lost Eldon Carl. We lost Mike Weidelick. I'd like to say something about Weidelick, uh, sure. which is what he did at Bakersfield PD, the never been done before or since. He joined in like 1967 when it was an agency of approximately 60 officers. And then the next year they had eight or nine shootings where no police bullets hit any bad guys. And the chief said, hey, Mike, can you fix this? And he said, yeah, I can, but you got to let me do it my way. And he said, well, what's your way? After a couple hours explaining the job was his. And they shot every month on a pretty, pretty tough course of fire. And the funny thing is Mike Weidelick didn't meet Jeff Cooper till 1977. So Mike Weidelick put his program together based on what he had read of Cooper's stuff, plus his own uh, his own intelligence. And uh, like Hackathorn, he was uh, former Army Special Forces. So as he said, you know what we do, I knew how to teach. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but, but they never, they didn't lose a single officer in a gunfight while Mike was the range master. Outstanding. Um, well, let's dig into his course of fire there for a second, if you want to do that. Yeah. Uh, so going from memory here, uh, and and uh, Mike's uh, rationale, they shot two shots at 10 feet. This is all from the holster, two shots in 10 feet in, I think, two seconds. And Mike's rationale, nobody should be closer than that. Then they shot two shots in, I believe, two and a half seconds at 20 feet. And Mike was like, that's the length of a car. The next one was 30 feet. And he said, that's from, and that was, 
I think that was two reload two and six seconds for auto pistols, eight seconds for revolvers. They're, they switched from, they were carrying 38s and clamshell holsters. They switched to, Mike wanted 1911s. They ended up with Smith and Wesson Model 59s and reserves still had revolvers. But anyway, that was uh, at 30 feet, which Mike said was from the curb to the front door. And then the last string was two shots in 3.5 seconds at 60 feet. And Mike said, that's from the opposite curb to the front door. <clears throat> and they shot it over twice. You needed 80% for passing. They had a, a scoring system that if you didn't make the part time, it penalized you on the score. And he said he had people that that didn't make didn't ever make the time, but shot so accurately they passed. And people on the opposite side that were real fast and their accuracy wasn't wasn't the best, but but good enough to pass. So so, uh, yeah. but it was. He said you could get get uh, a desk job or ultimately fired for not qualifying. So as he put it, the program had teeth. <laughs> yeah. But once a month. I mean, that's the part that. I asked Ken Campbell, I was taking some stuff to Gunsight the other day, and I said, hey, Ken, you were the sheriff. How many officers do you have? And he said, oh, I don't know, 50, 60. I go, okay, that's about what Bakersfield had. I said, you guys ever shoot once a month? He goes, no, once a quarter. So I think, I think once a month, there may be some agency of, of three guys somewhere <laughs> in, in uh, North Alaska or something, and they shoot once a month, but for a and Bakersfield grew in the agency and they, mm -hmm. they cut it back to twice every other month. Then they cut it back to quarterly. Mike said, if you cut it back any farther, I don't want this job. <laughs> so anyway, that's the brief history of Mike Weidelich who, uh, and he was one of the first gun sight instructors. He taught at the 250 class attended by John Helms and Larry Mudgett. Um, so, that this is a way I would put Bakersfield PD in perspective. They were getting results similar to D platoon Metro LAPD SWAT with a whole department. Oh. <laughs> yeah, before, before LAPD SWAT was getting those results. In fact, Mike said they'd go to training in LA and they'd go, oh, you're from Bakersfield. Our bank robbers go there to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I think that our type A training brethren they just don't understand the mechanics involved in trying to get an entire agency moving in the same direction in the especially when it comes to something like firearms training because you've always got that element of it's checking a box and this is something we have to do whereas those of us who are interested in training it's something we want to do and I just don't think a lot of the training community understands that. And to be able to get a whole agency moved into that level of shooting, you know, I like to think my guys outperform all the other guys in our state. They probably do. <laughs> well, you know, the, the evidence tends to look at that, but everybody only sees my good people. You know, they don't see well, at, at class, at, you know, at classes and matches, they don't see my people who struggle. So that, I think that tends to skew the data a little bit. And so far, uh, the guys that have chose to engage our people in gunfight have done a horrible job in picking the people in which to gain and gunfight. Go. Yeah. Uh, it's been uh, two, two of the three were, uh, are in the top five in the casino drill times right. that our gunfight guys tried to mess with. And right. that, that didn't go well for them. And then the oh, other yeah. guy they tried to mess with it with an SRT guy who was an instructor and he had an AR-15 in his hands. And yeah. that, that just, that does not bode well to success. It's been poor gunfight selection on, yep. on the part of the victims part or not the, the other parties. Part. Right. Um, but just getting everyone moving in that direction. And then the other thing you have to factor in that is turnover. It'd be one thing if I could take a group of people or any competent trainer could take a group of people and start with them, say, all right, we're going to start in January. We're going to work on gun handling and you're going to work on this dry, you know, all throughout January. Then February, we're going to add this element. March, we're going to add this element. And you could keep that going. And you could keep that same core group going. Eventually, you would develop a rather competent set of people. But what we see in the law enforcement world is, all right by March, you've got somebody that's not there anymore and you've got somebody that's new. 
do you have to do do you have to start does everybody go back to january or square one or how do you catch that person i believe and this is a hypothesis and i throw this out and say tell me why i'm wrong to people Uh and uh I believe, based on my own experience personally, and watching a whole bunch of students over the years, I taught at a police academy for, for like maybe five or so years in Florida. Uh, but anyway, I believe it really takes most people, uh, and this is from interesting talking about the history of it. Jeff Cooper wrote the handgun chapters to a book called The Complete Book of Shooting that was first published in 65, and then it was uh, revised in 82. But he has a thing about a training program. And he says, do this, do that, do 10 dry fires in the morning at the light switch and 10 dry draws at the evening at the light switch. And um, he says, after, it'll take you about 4,000 rounds and two years and you will be ready to enter competition. And you probably, you're not gonna win, but you're not gonna embarrass yourself or be a hazard. And the thing is back in the 60s, the especially, well, probably the entire 60s, because the leather slap, the first leather slap was was 56 and Big Bear and, and pretty quick, they were holding a yearly series of diverse matches. And for example, Eldon Carl won that uh, in, if I recall correctly, 1962. Cooper won it, I think, in 60. And it was more than the leather slap. So so throughout the 60s and into the, well into the 70s, the, the state of the art training you could get was happening in Southern California in competition every month. And uh, uh, talking to Hack- I've talked to Hackathorn a lot about this. As I, as I told you, I'm working on a, a documentary video on the history of training. And also it occurred to me that was going to take probably five years. So I thought, well, I could probably write a book quicker than that. And there'll be more information. And I'll let whatever I discover researching the book guide the video ultimately, but, uh, but Hackathorn said, you know, Cooper didn't start teaching in the United States, probably till around 1970. And so what would happen was he'd teach a class somewhere and there'd be somebody that was enthusiastic that started a program, like I think Hackathorn did, or uh, started a competitive program. But what you had was a whole bunch of activity in Southern California and then little pockets in, you know, Colorado or Missouri or Connecticut or whatever. Uh, Hackathorn uh, told me about some of those, but, you know, maybe half a dozen places, but they were not as, it wasn't like Southern California. And that's why I I really think I hit the lottery because I got in on the on the last few years of the good old days. And I wanna get to a guy named Gene Shuey, who's in his late eighties, he lives in Reno. He was the 1966 Southwest Pistol League B-class champion. He was also the 1960 Mr. USA uh, bodybuilder. And he's a a gunsmith to this day. And I wanna really grill him on what was the Southwest Pistol League in the late 60s? Because what I suspect is from their course book and other other things talking to people is that what I experienced in the late 70s was very similar to what was going on in the late 60s. In other words, a Southwest Pistol League that had hit its stride by that time. And, uh, And so I especially with this history uh, uh, project. I was talking to my tattoo artist who learned to tattoo in Hawaii in 1985. And he has a connection to the roots of tattooing. And uh, I realized from getting in on that tail end of the Southwest Pistol League, I have a connection to the roots of it. Not, not the leather slap, though we did shoot, shoot the leather slap 
uh, once or twice as part of the annual matches, but uh, they had a series of 11 matches every year and then the banquet in December. Um, but, but after that, as I mentioned, in 79, the gamesmen took over and the smoking gun is uh, not too long after that, the newsletter, which was called Combat, they changed the title to Challenge. <laughs> so, because <laughs> yeah. uh, they weren't no more combat in the Southwest Pistol League, <laughs> just yeah. a bunch of challenge. Um, and, uh, but anyway, in looking at the history of it, I'm looking at the history of training. And so obviously Jeff Cooper was, I, I came up with a, I, in fact, you're the first guy that saw it, I think. I go, that's brilliant. The Big Bang at Big Bear. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but go be ahead. Before we get into that, I want to, and before I lose my train of thought on this, I want to ask two follow-up questions on the Bakersfield thing. Uh, the course was published, I, I believe it was, I'm, Greg Elephants published it, and and uh, yeah, I wrote recently. I wrote I wrote that up and sent it as far as I could. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now in that, I may have transposed something. He said two rounds in one point five seconds at ten feet. I think you said two in two it, seconds. It probably was. It was. You're right. Yeah. It actually was one point five. Thank and, you. And then at the twenty feet, two rounds in two seconds. And I got think it. That is feet. correct. Because right. here's what Mike said that I put in that thing that I sent El Elfritz and I got this out of an email from Mike. He said, what they did is they added, they subtracted a point mm -hmm. for every quarter of a second you were over part-time. Right. So anyway, yeah. go ahead with your other question. I, I wanted to clear that up because I knew that article was out there and I wanted to make sure which, which well, one thank was, you. Was, was correct because get the angry emails. Wait a minute. He said this and this and this. And, uh, wow. there's, there's been some discussion online as to the target. What target were they using? Okay, so I think I, I think it was a proprietary Bakersfield target, as mm -hmm. I understand it. I talked to Paul Trent, who's a protege of Mike's and a friend, and uh, he doesn't remember exactly and can't get his hands on it. But, but it was something that the maximum scoring zone was something like nine by seven inches and again don't hold me to that because uh, i have not been able to get uh, absolute 100 uh, percent uh verification of that the second the second zone was maybe something like 10 10 by 12 or something and then the rest was the the rest of the silhouette but the thing that's interesting was the scoring uh it was like something like you get 10 for the middle and eight or nine for the next zone, but the next one down was six. So, so you paid a real huge penalty for not being in one of the first two zones. And when I first went to Gunsight in 91, the X ring was 12 inches. It was a 12 inch circle, um, which, is, which is quite a bit larger than what we're talking about here. And I don't know if it was your podcast, Maybe it was a John Hearn video. It was something where they were saying the importance of shooting at, at smaller target zones mm -hmm. is the benefit of that is real big, which I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, get your questions. Yeah, uh, just, I guess a follow up with that. What will be a cycle of modern comparable target if people just wanted to and shoot? Paul Trent said, or somebody said, use a use an IDPA target because you got an eight inch ring and then you got that next zone. So they said, use the IDPA target. Well, I feel vindicated because I suggested that in an internet discussion and I got just pilloried. If you're oh, not wow. shooting the exact target, it's not the same thing. And well, we don't know what the exact target was. So let's make it work with this. Yeah, and, and that comes as close to the horse's mouth as you're gonna get yeah. is, is he said, he said, I would follow Lee Weems advice <laughs> if the IDPA target. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't well, say that. well you know it's on the internet so we can claim anybody said anything so right. abe, abe lincoln would agree yeah there you go all right well thank so, you so yeah i i talked to hackathon about this of breaking it down by decade 
like what was happening in the 70s, the 80s and 90s, et cetera, as far as the trainers. So you had Cooper, then you had these people, mostly of whom came from Cooper, which I put Chuck Taylor in that, that you know, Chuck Taylor, Hackathorn, Clint Smith, Louis R. Buck, uh, you know, maybe a little later, Bill Jeans, uh, Jack Burr. But, but you had two people that were outside of that, one of which was Ayub, and the other of which was Bill Rogers, because even though, and John Shaw, obviously, as well, a little bit later, uh, Bill's book, uh, I'm going to talk to Bill, but his book pretty much answered most of the questions I had. And, and Bill was obviously a top competitor in the day. Uh, and, and he said Hackathorn showed him the Weaver stance, which Bill Rogers then went to the FBI Academy and, and showed them. And then he picked up pretty early on Enos and Latham and their, their uh, modern isosceles and switched to that. But, uh, but except for that, he was, except for the fact that he was shooting competitions, I'd say Jeff Cooper invented three things. He invented the combat competitions. He invented the shooting school. And I just realized a little bit uh, ago, he also invented the celebrity shooting instructor. <laughs> uh, so, so those three things did not really exist before Jeff Cooper. But, uh, but anyway, Bill Rogers uh, pretty much did his, his school. He said he opened his school in the late seventies in Florida and then went to Ella J. Yeah. Uh, but I also want to, something uh, experience you and I both had, shooting at Rogers with locked elbows and coming home <laughs> with elbows that were just beat to hell. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a turning point. Which I mean, I've got to figure out something different to do. And it uh, took me lots of repetitions over several years to break myself of that. And, and occasionally I catch myself snapping back to it because that's the strongest motor program I've got. Yeah, that makes sense. I had a, I was at a, I think it was a TACCON in Tulsa uh, and they had some little competition of the side and, and I did some reload that was dug out of my dark past in the Southwest Pistol League. I'm like, uh, I, I would say where the hell did that come from? But I know mm -hmm. <laughs> where it came from. Uh, it you hit on something there that, that caught my interest with the three things that Cooper invented, the last of which being the celebrity firearms instructor. And it occurs to me, you know, because I've been able to make such a wide swath through the training area in such a short period of time. And part of that, you know, I got to definitely attribute that in my association with, with Mr. Givens um, and the TACCON opening up so many circles is how much tribalism there is in the training community and that people get locked in on their one their one sensei and that that person's point of view well, is everything is that. Yeah. it, it, I mean, it is just, yeah yeah Becomes I mean, my the, instructors for example my instructors were two two out of the three of my mentors were were actually api instructors michael harry's and michael horn and so you know i was <laughs> I was thoroughly indoctrinated with that to the point I was given some lectures at the Soldier Fortune Convention in the early 90s. And I had a, I had a, a flat top and a little beard like yours. And uh, I came up to Peter Kokalis and I had given a, a talk on pistol training. I walked up to him and Hackathorn says, I do a good Kokalis. He says, came up to Kokalis and he goes, well, if it isn't our little Cooper clone. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh so i went through that but then the interesting thing was uh uh the i had i as i said i got i got into martial arts late in the early 90s and my instructor thought the sun rose and set around masada yub and john farnham and i said no no not masada yub you want jeff cooper you don't want masada yub and he's like, no, no, Masada Yub. And I realized that I could not have an opinion until I took a Masada Yub class. So I took LFI one. Well, when Michael Harris found out I signed up, he said, 
you're not taking a class with Masad the boob. And I said, I said, yeah, you. And so anyway, so I go into Ayub's class. It was in Long Beach. I usually sit in the front row and I'm sitting there with my arms crossed like this. And Moss is lecturing. I'm going, Masad the boob, Masad the, inside my head, Masad the boob. And then this little light started coming and said, you spent $600 and you're going to sit here for four days and not learn a damn thing. Who's the boob? And once I found out I was the boob, then a whole new world opened up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny that how I'll say we for the Imperial we. You know, we tend to focus in on we learn this technique, so this technique is the only thing. And then we see another instructor that's talking and they do something different in their technique. And we want to go, well, I'm going to shut this guy out because he's not doing what sensei taught me or what my master taught. And if you close your, your brain off at that point, you may miss a nugget in some other area. And there have been, uh, she's like Mike Seeklander published a video and I was watching it and like something early in the videos like the technique is like no that's not right, right. and i was fixing to stop the the video right, right. no i'm gonna sit here and watch it and later he did something in the video and like well holy smokes if i had stopped it i would have missed that what? and now i didn't exactly adopt what he did but i did kind of merge it into what i do and of course he's a world champion and i'm not so i should be so here's what i say how you get the value out of a class you have to pretend to believe everything because if you don't pretend to believe everything, you will filter in real time and you may filter out something. You may not just turn the tape off, but you may, you may miss it because you're saying massage the boob inside your mm -hmm. head. And if you look right beside my head, you can see some certificates that have the gun site logo you can barely make it out and those are i got an expert certificate signed by jeff cooper in rifle pistol and shotgun and you can see they have place of pride on my wall but you can't see the logo and you probably wouldn't recognize it but right above those is my lfi1 certificate and i got a lot of certificates but those are like some of the only ones i got on the wall and, and uh, then I got Thunder Ranch one below it, but, but, uh, but so what happened to me was that, that let me know there was more than one way to skin a cat, but especially I resolved to not be dogmatic and just shut somebody out. Uh, and, and so uh, I went along and I went to Rogers in like 96 or 97 and I walked up to him, I said, hey, Bill, I'm going to shoot Weaver. I've been shooting Weaver for 20 years. It's been working good for me. He said, go ahead, you know, whatever. Well, he was putting all his shots on one little spot. And I couldn't do that no matter how hard I bear down. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll try that. And lo and behold, I remember calling up Greg Hamilton and saying, Greg, Greg, this is going to sound insane. But I think the isosceles works better than the Weaver. And he says, you now know something that most firearms instructors do not understand. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the main point is not about technique, this or that. I've actually kind of come around and softened my position, something that I think it was, uh, what's the guy's name? Cagle. I think it's something David, David Cagle, Cagle said, is he says, he took all them, them Weaver class and he said, you know, Weaver works just fine at operational speed. And and I want to use that just for a second to digress and say, I think Louis Arbuck's work as he, he kind of first laid it out in hit or myth, I think his, his understanding and his uh, thing about that, that, you know, you need anatomical shooting on erratically moving targets that, that may have stuff you don't want to shoot in the foreground or the background. I think he, he was a genius with that. And because he's dead and people don't read dead tree paper books no more, I think that's in danger of being lost. Mm -hmm. And Ken Campbell apparently was an instructor for Louie. And apparently Louie's widow lives in Prescott. So 
I want, I want to get together with Ken Campbell and Lee and say, what do any of you remember about the specific drills Louie ran with his Mirage target system? Yeah, funny you mentioned the Mirage target. I have one of Mr. Auerbuck's actual Mirages boxed up in my office. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I, I, Mr. Shane Gosa put me in connection with that, and I, I snagged it up and uh, hoping – you know, at some point in time in the future, I would learn how he runs that. And I'm really just really hoping to go see Randy Kane because that's probably going to be a very good well, you, source. You of go to Randy Kane and I'll go to Ken Kimmel because I got one right behind me sure. in a rifle case uh, mm -hmm. that I traded a knife for. <laughs> <laughs> I know who got the better end of that deal with yeah. me. But uh, yeah, you know, if you do, if you get that from Randy and I get it from Ken and Lee, and then we put our heads together, maybe we can, you know, write the, the user's manual for the garage <laughs> target system. Uh, yeah. Hey, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to reproduce. No. As far as and, the target system I just itself. Believe it's a piece of the puzzle that, that what I would do in an advanced in-service classes I had at that academy in Florida, I'd put up a paper hostage, you know, bad guy in hostage and have everybody and these, obviously, uh, uh, I was at a class, these guys show up, Jaeger was there and he says, these guys start to tell him, well, I'm, and Jaeger says, I know everything about you by the fact that you showed up here <laughs> and that you were the only two. You know, it's the same two guys that showed up for every class. Well, I'd have people shoot the, the paper target hostage situation. You know, and we get like nine out of 10 or like if I had a SWAT team that was there, 10 out of 10, you know, woohoo. Well, then I'd bring out that Mirage thing <laughs> and it went down to about one out of 10. <laughs> It's different when it's moving and there's stuff in the foreground. And, then yeah, and especially really moving erratically, you know, that's what, what people don't get. And it's a piece of the puzzle. And, and a lot of people have pieces of the puzzle. I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, these people from the eighties and really through the eighties, it was kind of maybe a dozen guys. And then in the nineties, it kind of exploded. I was part of that generation uh, insights. I mm -hmm. think out of the, the, the stuff that came out of the Cooper Big Bang, I believe that Insights Training, when it was Holshin with Greg Hamilton, that that was probably the pinnacle. Now, I have to caveat that uh, as I have not trained with Dave Spaulding and, and mm -hmm. Ella Fritz uh, gives a lot of credit in watching his podcast with you and some other stuff, obviously. You know, that's I I'm ignorant of of that. But but uh, but I think I think insights, I think the thing about insights was there were two people in conversation. And I think that's what your podcast, you know, even though you're you're bringing the guests on, you're you're asking them follow up questions, you're ask you're you know, putting your own knowledge into that. And I think I think a conversation produces uh -huh. uh, stuff that one guy alone or i always say two people's a conversation three people's a committee <laughs> so my father had a saying that uh, uh camel is a horse that was put together by a committee yep yep exactly and that's why i detest being put on a committee for something and uh, that's like look if you want me to do it just tell me to go do it but if you want a committee uh, just tell right, me what the committee tell me what the committee decided and I'll help implement well, it. The thing if we have a conversation, I can call bullshit on you and you can call bullshit on me. There's no place to hide. Right. We can't say, oh, ask Bob what he thinks of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think uh, Lee, I think old Bob, he's he's could answer that question better than I could. They can't mm -hmm. duck either. <laughs> <laughs> uh before we talk about the guys from the 80s and the 90s, you you mentioned Mike Harris several times. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I would like to have a discussion on him because I think and I'm going to throw something out there. The proliferation of weapon mounted lights is one of those things that's leading to the loss of the technique of low light shooting which, when we had to hold the flashlight in our hands. And, you know, I, I, I came along at the time where you learned the Harry's technique. And now nobody teaches that anymore because you just got the light attached to your gun. Why do you need to know about the Harry's technique? Right. So that you're not like 
searching with your weapon mounted light would be one reason. <laughs> that would be like one real big reason. That's a that's a huge reason right there. But you know, people tend to to look at me strange when I say, you know, you're pointing your gun at them when you do that. They're like, well, yeah. I said, well, you're not legally justified to be pointing your gun at them. So why are you doing that? Well, was it you or something? I've been I've been watching a lot of videos since <laughs> since we first connected and it was i think it was on one of yours says says that's the way we do it around here is not a legal justification right. yeah uh, that was probably the episode with chuck haggard now one of the very yes. very, very early yeah, episodes yeah. Yeah. i love to ask my students especially my, my cop students is is like what legal justification do you have to meet you know what do you have to have in order to actually point the firearm at someone muzzle covering meat and they they try to come up with an answer to satisfy the question and then finally i tell them if you're not legally justified to be shooting them you're not legally be justified to have the muzzle on right and and then you get people with you know without trigger finger discipline and you have mm -hmm. a you know you have the traffic stop where you're like would you know i know you want to point that at me but would you please take your finger off the trigger yep <laughs> you know uh uh yeah the, so uh, what, what can we discuss about Mr. Harris? Oh my God. He, he, like I've realized and really, you know how, how you know something and then you know it at a deeper level and then you really get it and stuff. Uh, when, when Daryl Bolke was talking about Michael's uh, group there, uh, I mean, I, I realized that I had won the lottery <laughs> to be able to go to that. He, he, he was a character, first of all, but he, he really, he lived it. He was a shooting bum. He, he is, his uh, wife was a waitress and I'm convinced probably she made the money, but, but uh, he had a white van he called the war wagon that had all his stuff in it. And uh, he, he was on this, you know, every waking moment and probably in his dreams as well. And uh, that program he ran in uh, in Southern California was was again a, something that's never been before or since. Uh, and and Wyatt and Horn's full surprise matches, which sometimes I I guess it was either Wyatt and Horn doing it or Harry's. They were kind of two separate things, but they they were loosely affiliated because uh, I think. Harry's club quit the league over Horn and, and Wyatt being thrown out. So, so, I mean, they were all on the same page there, but, but uh, yeah, and there's a great, great mentor for a, for a 15, 16, 17 year old. Uh, he actually, something, uh, something I did as a hobby, I worked for China Lake and this, Marine Lieutenant Colonel came and I asked him, what do you do for, what do you do for shooting? You know, we do this stuff. It's crazy. Maybe we could help you. And he told me to read up on it. And, and long story short, for about a quarter century, just as a hobby, I took on uh, uh, advocating for better training with the Marine Corps, mainly by writing articles, though in the early days, I paid visits to some Marine bases. But Harry's went with me on one of those those trips. In fact, Harry's and I went to the Camp Pendleton Library and we went through every issue of Marine Corps Gazette from World War II up until the present. And they had in the December issue, they had an index and it would say like marksmanship articles. And we Xeroxed all those articles, you know, took us the better part of a day to do that. Um, so that's a Harry's story <laughs> there you go. um but you know he taught at gun site uh was was uh buddies with jeff cooper from the something if there's anybody out there that knows about the big bear mountain man program uh jay Hohenhouse and i talk on kind of a semi-regular basis and that's the one missing link that we'd like some some concrete firsthand uh, as you said, primary sources. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Did you ever have any discussion with Harry's about how he developed the the flashlight technique that he taught? 
No, but I think he just, he probably just, they had night shoots at the league occasionally. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure he just needed to come up with something and, and Harry's being Harry's like he would, he would put gadgets on his guns, like a, (laughs) a piece of aluminum that he, he put bolts screwed into his M1 to put a clothespin bipod on and stuff like that. So, so the Harry's technique was probably, uh, uh, just came out of his fertile mind. <laughs> uh, so then in the eighties, you mentioned, uh, and then in the nineties, you mentioned insights with, uh, with Holshin and Hamilton. And then who else did you mention? I don't know. Tom Givens really yeah. started, started teaching in the nineties. Um, Gabe Suarez started teaching in the nineties, writing for Paladin. Uh, Paladin Press was a good resource for a while. Kelly McCann, uh, uh, who was writing in in Guns and Ammo, uh, personal security column under the name of Jim Grover. Uh-huh. Um, Holshin gives gives uh, Kelly McCann a, a lot of credit for the individual tactics presenting that, and uh, uh, and Kelly's books in in. Uh, uh, Paladin Press, he had some good, good stuff that had the individual tactics. I mean, I, I really divide stuff up as, you know, what's your mission? Are you a military, a cop, or a private citizen? Because if you're the military, you just kill people and break things or whatever your rules of engagement say you can do. And as you know, the legal requirements for a private citizen, a cop, are basically the same. And the main difference is, when the shit hits the fan, a cop goes towards the fan and a private citizen, if they can arrange it, goes away from the fan. <laughs> so, so, but, but I do believe knowing what your, your mission is, is and really understanding uh, that if you're a private citizen, just you have no duty to go looking for trouble. And if trouble raises its head, if you can unask the area so much, the better. So, oh yeah, uh, avoidance is probably the best tactic you can de- deploy at any time. Yeah, and that's that avoidance includes like, do I really need to go get a pack of cigarettes in the bad neighborhood convenience store at two a.m., or or can I wait till Safeway opens in the suburbs or whatever you know whatever that is for you, and and think strategically uh, to avoid having to think tactically. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Dave Spalding. Dave's been an incredible mentor for me. Um, you know, he's he's winding down his teaching career, but in coming up later this year, he's running one in Ohio and then one in Colorado, uh, a week long, like a five day program. It's like he always said, if he was going to do a two fifty class, you know, what would it have been? And so you know you, what month you have Colorado a Colorado one is. Uh, I can look it up. I think June or July, and it's, I think it's unfortunately Col- my June and July are pretty full. Uh, I think it's in Colorado Springs. I can get yeah. that information, but you know that would be a chance if you could get in either one of those to get his whole program from start right. to finish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, if it's June or July, it's probably out because <laughs> I'm doing that surgical speed shooting summit in June and right. going on my my annual vacation with my wife in July. <laughs> All right. And, uh, All right. As as we came out, come out of the '90s, moving into like 2000, we had 9/11, and, and that right. was, uh, you know, you did have. What I'm trying to wrap my head around is the difference between the, what I'm calling the 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 first generation and second generation, or second and third, depending on how you define it. The '80s versus the '90s is, I know there was just a natural proliferation because it, gun sight was no longer the bottleneck. You could go a lot of places and get training, uh, you know, a dozen, let's call it. Um, and then, and then uh, I'm, I'm just really trying to figure out doctrinally or, you know, like who, who made major contributions? Like I consider insights made the major contribution to individual tactics. Um, uh, I consider, you know, obviously along Kelly McCann, as I mentioned, um, the I consider uh, Craig Douglas to be someone who has made 
a, a major contribution. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, you know, and who, I guess, major contributions and minor contributions, which is funny. I don't know if it's you. I think, again, I've just watched so many of your podcasts over the last week. It's all it's all a blur. And then I, I listened to the ones on Scott Reed's site where he's interviewing John Helms and and Ron McCarthy and and uh, but but uh, someone was talking about their essential skills and then there's there's the ones that are more ancillary an essential skill would be the ability to draw consistently from a holster into whatever consistent firing grip you want and and stance or position uh, aiming <laughs> trigger manipulation follow through those are all all essential and and uh you know, I kind of almost would put reloading as a secondary skill because if you have a reliable pistol and you apply the essentials, you're probably not going to need to reload. <laughs> uh, the essentials term was probably the Spalding episode. Okay. Yep. Yep. Sounds sounds right. I mean, you could call it fundamentals, but mm -hmm. essentials is is more descriptive. Uh, and and uh, but anyway, who who can who advanced? the essentials, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, but, but so 9-11, uh, you know, really that it was the fallout from 9-11 that's probably more significant, which is Clint Smith. I interviewed him this past summer up in Oregon, and he said that he kind of half jokingly wrote an article saying, when all these sandbox wars are over, you watch, there's going to be 300 new firearms instructors. <laughs> yeah and, and that kind of brings up the whole the whole issue of there was in that era this massive proliferation into carbine classes where everybody was showing up wearing battle belts and chest rigs oh yeah and everything else and like every special forces guy as he was retiring was hanging out a shingle and starting a training company and i think we're kind of starting to see the recession of that yeah, but what people are finding out is uh, making a living as a farm instructor ain't ain't what you think it is. No, it's you not. Know, my question to people, I'm a farms instructor. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, how many classes did you teach last year? Mm -hmm. You know, let me turn on the light. I'm sure I'm in a different uh, place than you are. Sure. I started with the sunshine. Uh, uh -huh. Go right ahead. Yeah. You know, and as he's doing that. I had a class scheduled last week in Indiana and had pretty good enrollment for it. And the night before I was supposed to leave for Indiana, uh, they got hit with major snowstorms and the airline canceled my flight. And so here I am. I can't get to Indiana to do the class like I was going to. And so I had to cancel the class, refund all that money. Uh, cancel. I was able to cancel hotel and rental car, but I can only get a credit back for the flight that I have to use by the end of right. the year. I lose that. You know, right. that's not something people think about when they think, oh, it's going to be great to be a firearms instructor. Um, you know, that. Yeah, that and again, they'll look at, you know, they'll look at, at gun site or they'll look at whoever and they don't realize those people put a lot of time in to get there. Yep. Uh, paid a lot of dues. Yep. Um I'm not, no, you'll, you'll get this, even though you said you started your training whenever, but, uh, uh, you know, I tell people, if you want to, if you want to for sure know that you're probably going to get something is, is I said, if you pick a trainer, ask them, did you ever teach any classes in the 20th century? <laughs> <laughs> As, um, and just to talk about that is, yeah. is uh, uh, my English teacher and Lyle Wyatt, who's a machinist, and I've asked other people, they've all said, you know, it really takes about 10 years to feel that you really know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was talking to uh, Dave Cox at Davis Leather uh, and with respect to leather, leather work. And he said, yeah, that's about when you're a journeyman <laughs> in leather working. And, and uh, 
Uh, but the thing is, that's not 10 years of sitting on your butt. That's 10 years of doing it. And that's the catch 22 is, and, and folks like you have an advantage I didn't have, which is there's just a lot of quality people to choose from and, and that you got your start. It sounds like with Tom Givens, uh, that picking the right guy to begin with. I mean, I was lucky to have Harry's that I met at that first match, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, you can, like, like I watch that David Cagle guy. Do you know how old he is? 24, I believe. Okay. I, so I look like that most of my life and people see what I look like now and they, their <laughs> eyes bug out. And I say, I got fat and grew mutton chops and then everything's okay. Cause that's what they were thinking. <laughs> they go, Oh, he knows. <laughs> yeah, I know. I look in my own damn mirror every day. So but I was skinny. Uh, Mike Weidelich saw a picture. Me and Lyle Wyatt sent him a picture. And Mike Weidelich's words were, oh, thank God, a picture of Andy that doesn't look like his high school yearbook photo. <laughs> I twice in the last couple of months have had uh, just a heartbreaking experience. I go into, into a restaurant and had the waitress called me sir and not like in a nice customer service way. It was like, Gosh, I'm finally old enough that, that these people are looking at me going, he's a sir. <laughs> yeah, I got I can I can one up you there. These two cops down in, in uh southern Arizona were doing a thing for surefire, and I did a little live fire block. And uh and the one guy said he told me, he says, Yeah, we're driving home. And KJ said, Man, that old man can shoot. <laughs> that old man. <laughs> I thought yeah. I was I thought I was 15 years old still. Yeah, I'm at the point where I'm starting to get uh, cops on the range that uh, are younger than the number of years I've been on the job. And uh, yeah. I, I really thought I was hit getting old when the first baseman on my little league baseball team posted a picture of his grandson on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, wow, that, that, that's bad. And then. Yeah. I teach college classes and I had the daughter of a member of my kindergarten class in one of my college classes. I'm like, yeah, this, this is where father time is marching on here. I got my first, got my first grandchild a couple of years ago, but anyway, back to Kegel, I was watching yeah. him listening to his stuff is, and again, I thought he was probably in his late twenties, but, but the amount of quality training that he has had you know, and he's obviously a go-getter, mm -hmm. and and I I have no reason to doubt that he will just continue till he's my age, and and you know he'll be he'll be ahead of me just because because of his his head start. Yeah, he's you know? he he's been fortunate to have uh, some very good guides guiding him but also so you know uh, some variety like with mm -hmm. his thing where he talked about his foray into the modern technique yeah. um uh but but to to if i'm not mistaken you know do a lot of work with paul howe kind of as a foundation mm -hmm. i mean boy because that's pretty cool because that's not only that's not only high speed but you got kind of some old school thrown in for good measure there right and uh yeah, anyway, the, yeah. just talking about 2000, the one thing that I have not had a lot of any training with really is the Delta guys like like uh, Kyle Lamb, Pat McNamara, uh, uh, I'm not Delta, but uh, uh, Haley, Travis Haley, mm -hmm. the couple of SEALs that are doing stuff. I, I have not got, and I set them apart definitely from the guys that that started sometime in the last 10 years coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, those guys, again, they're, they got, they got some depth, they got a real solid foundation. And uh, I was talking to somebody, and they're talking about say, say you got somebody they they pretty much know how to teach shooting, but there's other stuff they need to teach like a reload. And they go, oh, I got to teach a reload. Um, uh, I guess I'll do this. And they don't know that, hey, you know, people been thinking about this for a while. <laughs> if That's part of, by the way, why I'm doing this history thing sure. is in the, in the, the 
uh, foolish hope <laughs> that new newer firearms instructors would find out uh, the the giants on whom shoulders they stand. <laughs> Uh, while you were telling that, I, I texted David and he confirmed that he was 24 and he asked, why did I want to know? And I said, well, Andy, Stan Andy Stanford's asking. He's like, the surgical speed shooting guy? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes, that Andy Stanford. So David's aware of you. And uh, no, tell uh, him, tell him I'll, I'll, I'll send him and you. I only got a couple of copies left. Sure. Uh, I'll send you each autographed book. And I, do you know who uh, Caleb Giddings is? Mm hmm. Yeah, so Caleb was at the revolver roundup at Gunsight, yeah. and I handed it to him and I said, 90% of this is mostly right. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, 10% of it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it's up to you to figure out which 10%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, John Hearn had given me a question for you. Let me get back over onto my phone where I had that down. Um, and I'll just paraphrase the question. It's, all right, you've got all these training evolutions, like starting from the 60s and 70s on up into to now. And John just basically wants to know the incremental changes that have come over the training industry now. And so you take a person that's graduating from a modern gun school and you take somebody that graduated from gun site in 78 and they practiced all, you know, they went through gun site in 78 and they've been diligently practicing everything that they learned back then. And then they, all of a sudden they're confronted with an armed robbery situation and they have to deal with them. Is there any significant difference between what we now consider the, I guess, the postmodern evolution of firearms training and what the performance from that student would be to a student from 78? Well, uh, uh, I actually, in my, in my book, that's, that's 90% mostly right. Uh, <laughs> I had, I had a thing I said, I said, if you shoot Weaver and you are happy with how you're shooting, it, you may not think it's worth the effort to put in to change. So that's, and I also said in the same, probably within a paragraph or two of that, I said, I know, I know many people who shoot better than I do with their Weaver-esque stances. And, and so, uh, you know, we go, go to, you went to that, uh, that, uh, Larry Mudgett instructor mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, the, the aiming and trigger manipulation part of it, but even more what Spalding said, I think it was on one, on your podcast, the perceiving the need to draw is more important than the sub second draw. Yep. Um, and, and, uh, Greg Hamilton was teaching at uh, Gunsight, and I said, hey, Greg, I'll get to the direct answer to your question in a sure, second. Sure. Uh, but I said, Greg, you advocate the isosceles, but you're teaching at Gunsight. How can you do that? And he goes, easy. This is my, this is my isosceles. This is my weaver. <laughs> he, he like <laughs> dropped his elbow one inch. He said, there's so much important to teach. Oh, and I got, there's so much important to teach them besides that aiming gun. So, so uh, the first class I taught at Tom Given's place, he said, oh, before we, before we shake on this, there's, there's one thing. He says, I do not want you to say the word isosceles because I teach Weaver to my students. I don't want them to be confused. And I said, okay, Tom, fair enough. I have one question for you. I said, is your check going to bounce? He said, what? I said, is your check going to bounce? He said, no. I go, well, then we got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so I taught that whole class, mm -hmm. the surgical speed shooting class, two days without saying isosceles and giving those people a lot of stuff. So the answer to your question is uh, someone, you know, Michael Green, I never met him. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a former special forces mm -hmm. and, and uh, apparently teaching. Uh, he said he went to front side. He said, it was real fun, man. It was like, I went back in a time machine. And he said, but, but the thing he said was, he says, 
anybody that gets a master rating on their test probably shoots pretty good. Yep. So the answer to your question is, I mean, I follow the thing that I, I got from Masada Yub, mindset, tactic, skill, equipment, that, that the mindset part of it and the tactics part of it, usually what gonna determine it, but what I also realized, which is why I'm doing this surgical speed shooting summit partly is, if you're gonna have a gun as part of your, as Ayub says, safety rescue equipment, you need to be able to use that gun consistently on demand to a, a reasonably decent level. Do you gotta be Rob Latham? No, but it's the consistently on demand part that's, that's it was like, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, John Hearn talking about Paul Howe's 1.7 draw, you know, he says, that's if you're tired, if you got a gas mask, any of it. Yeah. So, so the, I say there's three variables, uh, speed, accuracy, and consistency. And, and, uh, as Hackathorn says, uh, Jim Cirillo shot some Ipsic, where'd he place? Middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to say Jim Cirillo is not a gunfighter. <laughs> yeah. So how would you define speed in that in that context? So here's what I've come to realize. I'm still I'm working on some training stuff with Surefire. So I've been thinking about this full time for like five years is so you got an officer or you have a person, private citizen with a concealed weapons permit. They're going to they're going to be able to consistently draw in some time whatever that is. Now, could they get faster with practice? Sure, probably. But, but as, you're not going to tell the officer that's in the lower third or the bottom 10%, you're fired. You, you need the bodies for one thing. But, but let's flip that to the private citizen. You've got some person that that's not particularly athletic. Maybe they look like me. <laughs> Maybe the, uh, uh, but they have a right to defend themselves. You can't tell them, well, don't even bother, you know, just right. roll over and piss on yourself and, and let the guy stomp on your head. You're not going to tell them that. So, so I'm really looking at, particularly with what Spalding says about seeing seeing the timing gabe gabe swore as i interviewed him on on tape a few days ago and and uh, i said tape that shows how old i am uh, <laughs> video the the on film <laughs> on eight super eight I, I interviewed gabe on super eight well anyway gabe said uh uh you know i don't talk about speed so much as timing of when you draw and holshans talked about that mm -hmm. but i'm not saying Faster is not better. And who was it? It was a, probably on your podcast again, because that's what's in my head. When he said a sub one second draw is a tactic. Yep. And, and if you have that tactic available to you, you can use it. But guess what? If you don't have that tactic available to you, don't, don't use it because you ain't got it. Right. Use some other tactic appropriate. So what is the speed? You know, uh, I was talking to somebody who said, you know, probably you should be able to draw and get a shot at under three seconds, you know, a good every time, every time, if you can draw and every time get a good hit in under three seconds, is that as good as two seconds? No. Is it as good as one second? No. But uh, tell a lot better than 10 seconds. <laughs> So, so I guess I'm just looking, I'm trying to look at it from a different, a, a completely different angle, which is everybody places somewhere on the score sheet. Maybe if you can place the same place every time, that's good enough. I don't know. All right. Well, then your, your next one was accuracy. So what is the accuracy standard? I'm, I'm a fist size group in practice with the logic that, that I say, you know, here you are, you know the problem, it's, it's a bright sunny day and nobody's trying to kill you. When it's for real, do you think your group's gonna get smaller or bigger? 
And someone said that some SEAL once said, a one inch group in training turns into a 10 inch group on in the field, you know? And, and I tell you, I am, another thing I've recently kind of come to Jesus over was, was when you pull the trigger, you're unleashing death. And you better take that as serious as a heart attack. And I think that, that we are, especially with competition, uh, Holsham blew up the internet on a, on a match results I sent him. I have a student that she want, wanted to do better at the gas match, the Gunsight alumni shoot. And we went to a local USPSA match. There were 13 people there. I told her, your job is to hit every single round in the A zone and I don't care about your time. I said, and I'm gonna do the same thing. Well, I was eighth out of 13 and she was 11th. Uh, the guy with the most A zone hits was second. I had the second most A zone hits. She had the third most A zone hits. The guy that won had two hostage hits and five misses. And it's like, uh, excuse me, I mean, where I'm at, and I, I truly believe if you got a competition that's allegedly, allegedly uh, relating to combat, mm -hmm. is anybody who hits a hostage should hit finish below anybody who didn't, yep. and anybody who had a miss should finish below anybody who didn't. And if you're that good, you know, don't miss. Exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I think we're given the wrong, what I say, I say, you're, you watch these, uh, these USPSA uh, and IPSC matches, and your typical IPSC stage looks like the gold medal round at a school shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, bang, 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 run, go, reel, bang, 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 and, and just running around shooting. And, and Rob Latham said, uh, when he started in the late 80s, this is something he said, this, the shooting problems we had were far more diverse than you get today. Yeah. He said, you might have to shoot weak hand around a barricade from 50 yards. Uh, it's course design uh, is, it's, it's just become kind of like Ipsic shooting relates to gun fighting as biathlon relates to killing Russians in Finland in 1940. <laughs> there you go. We, we shall all take a take a, a moment to recognize Samuel was it Samuel Haya, is that how you say his name? Yep. Simo Haya. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. With his iron sights. <laughs> yeah. And by uh, choice. He could have had a scope. He didn't want one. Uh, I think Khrushchev's favorite famous quote was that Russia captured just enough Finnish territory to bury their own dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. 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 There you go. Uh, well, well, let me submit this to you on accuracy. Or maybe it should go fall up under consistency. After 20 something years of doing this, I finally come to the conclusion that the real meaning of rule four mm -hmm. is that you have to be able to put the round where you intend for it to go where it's meaningless. Well, that's true here. I'm going to pull something out I did for Surefire. Right. This is this is a target that that I'm I it took me a while by the way and several iterations. So you yeah. see that. Yeah. Right. The the this is 5 inches. Mm -hmm. This is 2 and a half inches. The outer circle is 10 inches. Um this is printed on a on a uh, 11 by 17 so you can copy them like crazy mm -hmm. and i hope to be disseminating these sure. uh but but uh five inch five inches is is kind of you know you go three you go four whatever but but uh not more than five in my book right and and misses you know misses are not acceptable and this is the thing so here let's go you're talking like speed and standard and we're talking about accuracy uh wherever you can hit five inches is you should uh, if you're a good man you know your limitations <laughs> and 
And instead of uh, running cops through stuff, a standard state qual, which I know states got to do that and cities and counties got to do that just because that's what they got to do for liability. But, but maybe beyond that, you, like I say, everybody's going to finish somewhere on the score sheet. And if, if you got some agency of, of, you know, take, take Phoenix, you know, thousands or LA thousands or new New York tens of thousands, whatever it is, is I think you'd be better off getting the officer to understand his or her limitations than, than, uh, telling them they're a failure because yeah. they got to go out and do the job and the the you know the 78 year old guy with a cane uh who has a right to defend himself he needs to know what his limitations are so i i'm really working on a different way of looking at this which is just realizing each individual they do need the ability to shoot accurately and do the gun handling tasks of, of you know, operating their firearm and drawing it from the holster. And, and of course, the most important thing of all is safety because, because most cops are not gonna be in a gunfight and most private citizens are certainly not gonna be in a gunfight. And, but every time they handle their gun, there's a risk of death. Mm -hmm. And so, so to get people to really understand that, I was lucky when I was 12, I went to this basic rifle marksmanship school and the guy that talked about safety, he was like six feet tall with a handlebar mustache and a smoky bear hat and put the fear of God in us <laughs> about safety. And that was a good start. Right. And, and yeah. Do you want to define consistency? I mean, yeah, you can talk nine out of 10, 99 times out of 100, whatever, however you want to set that. But, but, uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost every time that's, I know that's fuzzy, <laughs> <laughs> but there, you can't say every time because you're dealing with humans, but what can you do almost every time? You know, what would you bet a hundred dollar bill any day of the week that you could do and feel confident of not losing that hundred dollar bill? Uh, and, and again, so it's interesting when you're saying define it. I think trying to come up with definition, you know, shoot a two second bill drill or a five second president day or whatever. It's like, it's like, well, that's all good and well, but, but everybody, I think if they can simply understand where they're at, uh, you tell me, because you've you've been the chief deputy. What was the size of your agency when you were chief deputy? Uh, Ninety-five total personnel, but mid fifties as far as sworn carrying guns. Okay, so so you'd probably agree that if we got a room full, of, certainly the people on your podcast, but even if we got a room full of of experienced state qualified law enforcement firearms instructors. And we ask them in, in three sentences or less, tell me, write it down, tell me what does it take to hit a target with one shot? That most or all of those people would say, you know, you got to aim and aim, aiming and trigger control or line up the gun and pull the trigger without moving it or some variation of that. And my question to you is, what percentage of your gun carrying cops know that to their core? Know that if you give them a BB gun and tell them to shoot a tin can, that, that they got to use those sights and pull that trigger just as if they had a deer rifle or uh, their service handgun. Do they, because I thought, being, I asked you a question, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I'll say this out of the, say I've got 55 right now carrying, right, carrying right. guns. There are probably five of us that I would be willing to put money down could make the shot every time. Well, I'm not saying make the shot. I'm saying yeah. understand. So here's what I realized from teaching at the police academy. 
we taught them all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. we, we probably told them sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, whatever. But did we spend, did we spend 30 minutes of every hour telling them it again and again in a bunch of different ways to where, to where when they walked out of the academy, see, here's what I know from working with the Marine Corps a bit is, is they may have had some, some training that dated back to the, the previous century, but pretty much every Marine knew that you got to get the sights going and work your trigger correctly or good enough. <laughs> and, and I call it the shoot that circuit. If I point at something, I go, hey, Lee, shoot that. You go, oh, okay, well, line it up, pull the trigger, bang, you hit it. And they shoot that, and then they shoot that now. <laughs> yeah. anyway. uh, I think a, a very high percentage would understand that they've got to get the gun aimed at what they want to shoot and then press the trigger. Good. Um, and I, I give you credit for having a good percentage. Here's what uh, my, my soapbox, every cop on the planet you're giving somebody a deadly weapon and you're saying you carry that deadly weapon at all times on duty or you're fired. You're, yeah. you're insisting that they have a, a death BB launcher mm -hmm. and a bunch of death BBs that you gave them. They should know what it takes to it, and here's something I'll throw this out occurred to me last week, week before, is every cop should understand that what they need to aspire to be when they pull their pistols is a sniper, not a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, sitting here thinking about that and then recent training experiences and what I'm noting now that I... You know, when I was the chief deputy, I kind of had control over the training program, but I wasn't necessarily me out there turning the wrenches on the bolts all the time. Right. Uh, now that I'm just specifically over training, it's me uh, turning the wrenches on the bolts all the time now, and I'm seeing more and more close contact with our people. My assessment of our own training program is that we've done a really good job or a pretty good job of explaining and teaching the getting the gun aligned, pressing the trigger portion of it. Um, what I'm seeing is that anything that gets out of that, like a any kind of malfunction or something that our people don't necessarily know how to just automatically clear that, that that the, the gun handling is not there. Right. And right. so that that's that's the part where I'm going to go back and start focusing on that and bringing that back up to the speed while still continuing to maintain uh, the accuracy. All right. Well, Weidelich told Hackathorn, he said, "Were all my guys great gunfighters? No." He says, "But the worst, the worst shooter on the department. Once we got the new program, they got twice as good. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking the worst person, that's that's pretty good. And we." I had this, this lieutenant down, down south. I said, give me your 10 worst shooters. It's about a 225 man agency. Give me your 10 worst shooters for 10 weeks, one hour a week. Well, the 10, the first week, the 10 was nine. And then after that, it was no more than eight. And it was as low as three. But, but he, he said that, that one of the guys he says, he, he says, you, you remember Adrian? I said, was that the overweight guy? He goes, no, he was the, it was kind of the skinny Hispanic guy. I go, yeah, I think I remember him. He says, well, we just had our latest call. He shot a perfect score. <laughs> and so I've come to realize we're not, we're not going to have the wide lick situation. Mm -hmm. To have the wide lick situation, you have to have your, your chief or sheriff, 100% on board, time, ammo, whatever it takes, you know, firing people if necessary, which that probably ain't going to happen today. But, but uh, uh, and then you also need a, a enthusiastic, competent trainer. You need both of those things. And absent that, which is the reality for 99% of the places on the planet, what you can do is make things better. And here's what I realize is, given that this is literally life and death, 
better is a pretty good thing to accomplish with your hours in the day. Yeah. You're, you're making things better in a realm that is literally life and death for all kinds of people. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one to look at it is are you going to completely reach every student and get them to the level that you want them to be at when they leave your training? Probably not, but can you make them better before they yeah, leave the training? And is you that make, your... If you switch one person on, here's what I, I, I say anymore. I'm in, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. No, no go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Is I tell people who am I interested in? I'm interested in the group of people from barely trainable to almost self-motivated because anyone who's self-motivated is probably going to be okay. And then I realized if I can get someone out of that group into self-motivated, that's an absolute win. But, but working with that middle demographic, which is most police officers and most people with concealed weapons permits. And, and if I was king, there'd be a two-tiered system, which apparently GIGN, the French counter-terrorist unit, actually had. And if you were in the first group, they'd issue you a four-inch revolver. And if you were in the latter group, they'd issue you a long-barreled one. Well, if, if you're one of the people that has truly got some capability, you get the little gold pin you can carry what you want. You can do what you want, et cetera, et cetera. If you are in the other group, you are allowed to use your firearm within one car length. And are you allowed to take a hostage shot? Yes, if your muzzle's against the hostage taker's head. <laughs> so, so I'd have a two-tiered system. There you go. Uh, anyway. you, you've mentioned the speed shooting summit you've got in the works. Do you want to discuss that in this setting? Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a bunch of trainers together. Basically, I wrote surgical speed shooting in the late 90s, and then I taught it for 10 years or so, and it evolved. And I ain't teaching no more. I taught one at Jaegers, and the certificate said Joe Blow has completed the last ever surgical speed <laughs> shooting class. However, I realized I put a lot of effort into evolving it and thought. And I want to, A, I want to pass it on and, and B, I'd like to be entertained while passing it on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the material on the, the first two days are for the instructors I'm inviting. And I'm going to present the material on day one. And on day two, I'm going to offer myself up as a pinata and they can, can uh, disagree or say whatever they want to say. On the weekend, which is June 18th and 19th, all of these instructors will be divided into three teaching teams. The students will be divided into three groups, which will rotate through those teams. And then we'll shuffle the instructors again for day two and rotate the three groups of students through three different groups. And, and so far, uh, John Holshen, John Hearn, Greg Elifritz, Claude Werner, uh, Michael Green, and, and, and uh, actually Brad Ackman, the, the director of training at Front Sight, said he was going to attend. So it'll be a, a diverse group of instructors, and the, the focus will be on handgun skill building. And that's, again, it's 18th and 19th of June. Uh, and it'll be a tactical response and you can sign up at the tactical response website. Okay. So that part will be for people to sign up as students and then all the yes. instructor can or instructors are invited. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. uh, we, you and I've talked about it. I'm trying to work out a scheduling issues so I can get there. Yep. Yep. And, um, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I, I, I missed out on the, uh, the options of personal security. Yeah. I remember as I got into the, the, training world in, in like 2014 i would yeah, see gone by then <laughs> yeah i would see references to it and i would always kind of watch and then every now and then i'd see you popped up somewhere and i never got a chance to get in on that uh you, you talked about how it's evolved if you were writing the book again now what would you change i would change my draw stroke which is which uh 
Craig Douglas, I believe. Uh, the way I'd put it is your 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 contact distance draw stroke will probably work if the bad guy's at 25 yards, but not necessarily vice versa. So my draw stroke would be different. A little bit of the gun handling would be different. Uh, I'd rack the slide overhand, whether right-handed or left-handed. Um, I do my, and kind of Hackathon was doing this, I guess. I do my, my pistol uh, manipulations from looking through the trigger guard at, at wherever I need to be looking. And one of the main reasons for that is uh, that I can, you know, yeah, I got the second story to worry about, but I can turn in 360 degrees. So, so it's mainly a movement thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is different. Um, pet, pet peeve that I think is actually in my book that I committed <laughs> is the term reset. Now, now some people have taught to what you're looking for in following through after the gun goes bang is to let the trigger forward to the reset point with the logic that then the amount you have to pull is, is minimized. Uh, well, I'd say if you're going just to reset, you, you may not go to reset. So I say, let the, let the trigger go beyond reset, whatever that is. I don't obsess over that, but my main pet peeve is the use of the term reset to mean follow through or slack out. Uh, to me, reset is a very specific point in the trigger action where the gun mechanically can be fired again. And so there you go, I'll uh, get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you like to talk about tonight that I have failed to ask you about? Oh, I think we've covered, we covered actually a lot of stuff. <laughs> I don't know if any of it, I don't know if any of it made sense, but what I actually, what actually what I would like to talk about is just get back to what, what I guess Dave Spaulding calls the essentials mm -hmm. is, is the ability to get your gun out of the holster expeditiously, consistently with a, with a consistent grip that does not shift under recoil. Now I would say we've discovered what the high performance shooting is and that's all good and well, but, but uh, if you're consistent, I mean, I shot Weaver for, for damn near 20 years. And I was, I was allegedly shooting Weaver when I won the National Tactical Association. So, so your, your earlier question, uh, I think being consistent uh, and, and remember where you're most likely to screw it up is when you pull the trigger and to, to do enough dry fire, uh, something talking a, a Holshan about Larry Mudgett's class, the, the use of what he calls skip loading and I call ball and dummy is uh, you can do that to check yourself. I mean, just load a magazine with ball and dummy and shoot and you can check yourself. And I'll just, I guess I'll leave you with this one drill from Ron Avery that he put in, in uh, police magazine, I think, is you load the gun and remove the magazine, uh, semi-auto. You fire the live round and then do the dry fire. And if, if you do that at the beginning of every session, you'll get a lot of, of good work on, as in the words of, of Rob Latham, pulling the trigger without moving the gun. <laughs> and it's, it's, my, again, I'll re refer back to my tattoo artist. I was talking about something. He goes, yeah, yeah, that all sounds good. You know, I, I just kind of like doing 15 minutes of dry fire. <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Is surgical space shooting still in print? No. <laughs> okay. But, it, but it's only 90% mostly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you got to figure out which 90% or two, which 10% is wrong. There you go. Right. All right. Now, don't overcomplicate this. <laughs> it's not that there's about there's about a half a dozen things mm -hmm. that if you can do those half a dozen things consistently and and in the ballpark 
of well. You'd probably be okay. And, and I know I said I was leaving you with that, but I'm really gonna leave you with this. Uh, for the private citizens, the cops don't always have, have that alternative. But the thing I was most proud of for my career and my gun writing career is getting this, this sentence published wherever I could, which is your number one option for personal security is a commitment to avoidance, deterrence, and de-escalation. And that's, that's where the payoff is much more than aiming and trigger control and that sub one second draw. <laughs> There you go. Uh, there's a lot of truth in that statement. A lot of truth in that statement. Well, sir, I have enjoyed the conversation uh, very much so tonight, and I look forward to, to having more future conversations with you. Uh, for, uh, for the audience, um, if you would go to the firstpersonsafety.com webpage and look at those upcoming classes, as I said, I already had to cancel one this year. I've got a couple of other uh, because of the weather. Uh, I've got a couple others coming up and I uh, sure would like to have some, some people fill in those spaces. And uh, so if you would, and they're anywhere near you, take a chance to look at them and uh, sign up if, if it's of interest to you. Uh, I understand that everyone's most important asset is their time. And so I want to thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. So thank you everyone for tuning in.